Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you before we begin a note from our sponsor i'm richard jacobs executive director of the nonprofit finding genius foundation and host of the finding genius podcast in late 2016 i was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway which sent me off-road into a ditch the impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out, and I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now to our guest. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest, uh, Mark Holtzapple. He's a professor of chemical engineering at Texas A&M University. This time, we're going to talk about desalination or desalinization. I tend to say it both ways. Uh, Mark, thanks for coming back. My pleasure. Yeah. Well, if you would tell me, um, why, uh, why do you study this area? Why do you study desalination? Well, it actually goes back to the days before I was a professor. I was in the, in the Army, and we were trying to figure out how to uh, desalinate water uh, for the military. So I, I did some projects while an officer in, in the army uh, on desalination. So I've been pursuing this area of interest for about 40 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, when I look at a, you know the globe and I look at all the coastlines, it seems like, ooh, this might be a really juicy opportunity and we can get tons of fresh water, but I understand it's uh, got a, a lot of energy costs to do. And so what are the main techniques or ways of desalinating ocean water right now? Well, uh, the historical way, which is known to the ancients, uh, like the uh, uh, Greeks uh, on their ships, sailing ships, they would just boil the water and, and collect the condensate. Uh, so uh, salt is not volatile and uh, water is volatile. So if you uh, boil water, uh, salt water, uh, the salt stays behind in the liquid phase and the steam that comes off the top is salt free. Uh, so that, that's been the historical uh, way of, of doing it. If you do that in a, a single step, like I just described, let's imagine you have a, go to your kitchen and you get a pot of, uh, that you would normally use to make spaghetti and you put some salt water in there and you put it on the flame and you start boiling away water, uh, you're going to consume about a, a thousand BTUs for every pound of water uh, that you, you collect. Uh, so that's very, very energy intensive and no industrial process does it that way. There's a very clever method where you, you take the steam off, off that first 
boiling water and you use that steam to make more steam. In other words, if let's imagine that the steam that you produce is at a hundred degrees Celsius. Uh, if you contact that hot steam with salt water that's at 90 degrees Celsius, you can cause that water to boil. And then the steam that comes off that is 90 degrees. If you contact that with 80 degree salt water, you'll cause that to boil. And so if you had, let's say 10 of these steps, uh, you would reduce your energy consumption from a thousand BTUs down to a hundred BTUs. Uh, so you would- Hey Mark, how would you, um, I thought the boiling point of water usually is, uh, you know, a hundred C. So ah, how would you, question. how would you have 90 degrees C boil 80 degrees? You have to mess with the uh, pressures or what? Yes, sir. It, it, you, you nailed it. So you are exactly correct. Uh, uh, the normal boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. If you put salt in the water, the temperature rises. You know, it might be, uh, let's say, 105 degrees Celsius, some, some number like that. Um, but if you, uh, if this set, so the first effect that your, your uh, kit, your, the, the boiler on your kitchen stove uh, would be, at, let's say, around 100 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere of pressure. Uh, the next stage that you go to would be 90 degrees Celsius and maybe 0.85 atmospheres of pressure. And then the next stage is uh, 80 degrees and maybe 0.5 atmospheres of pressure. Uh, so by lowering the pressure of each of the subsequent stages, you can still get it to boil. Uh, so so that, that's, that's the trick. Yeah, I was going to say, why not have the water come into a chamber and then partially evacuate it and then you have to boil at a lower temperature. Maybe that would work. Uh, that's that's actually entirely feasible. If you took salt water at room temperature and you put it into a vacuum changer, chamber and and you know sucked on it, uh, you could pull water out of it, and the water would get cold as a consequence of that. Uh, so you'll you'll pretty quickly find that you don't get much out of it. You know, maybe point uh, one percent or something like that of the water could be recovered, and then it gets so cold that it's even harder to get any more water out of it. And eventually it could freeze <laughs> if you if you keep doing that too much, uh, it'll actually cause the water to freeze. Well, as the um, as water boils with salt in it, um, you know, the salt concentration increases. Um, what does that do to the energy requirements to boil it, the pressure requirements, it, it, et cetera? Uh, it makes it harder uh, as uh, there's, there's something called uh, brackish water. Uh, if you dig under the ground almost anywhere in the United States, uh, you'll find brackish water. Uh, often the salinity is, you know, maybe 2,000 parts per million, 5,000 parts per million, whereas the sea is 35,000 parts per million. Uh, so it, the seawater is like 30 times more concentrated than than brackish water. Uh, well, brackish water uh, is not that salty, and it, it doesn't take all that much energy to uh, remove water from it. Uh, but seawater, uh, being much saltier, takes more energy. Uh, and uh, as you go further and further and further, pulling more and more water out, the salt gets more and more concentrated, and you just have to work all the all the more harder uh, to uh, uh, to get that last bit of water out. Um, could you couple this decreasing pressure system with um, another type of system, you know, maybe uh, an HVAC type unit, or you know what else could you do with the system to suck out every bit of energy used? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, normally, you have to put a, a, a energy in uh, to the process uh, and to drive it, uh, and HVAC systems also take energy in, uh, so it's it's kind of hard to couple them and get something useful uh, from it. Uh, uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, just, uh, I guess, this, this process that I've been describing is called multi-effect distillation, uh, and it's used in industry, and it is used a little bit in uh, by municipalities to make water. Uh, so that's uh, that's one method. It, it, I would say maybe 3% of the desalination processes use this method. It's, it's a pretty, pretty small uh, method. Uh, there's another method for, for evaporating water, which is very clever. Uh, you, you take the seawater and you, you put it into a tube that gets ever hotter as it goes through the tube. Uh, after it comes out of the tube, uh, you put some energy into it, steam or sunlight or whatever, make it even hotter. And then you put it through a series of stages, each at lower pressures. And as you take that hot, salty water and you drop the pressure, some steam flashes off of it. And that flashed steam 
hits the tubes and condenses on the tubes. And you collect that water as though it's raining in the system. Uh, and it's, it's that condensing water uh, that causes the, uh, uh, the, the water and the salt water in the tubes to heat up. Uh, so that's called multi-stage flash. That's pretty widely practiced, uh, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, the nice thing about that technology is uh, the, uh, you don't have a boiling salt in contact with your heat exchanger. Uh, so that you keep the tubes clean and you don't get salt encrusting uh, on the tubes. Uh, so, so that's uh, pretty widely used. I, I don't have the exact numbers, but uh, you know, maybe. So you said in the um, in the Middle East they do this. I, I was imagining if you had a solar array that could act as a partial, you know, additional energy source. Uh, yeah, you you certainly could, could use solar energy to heat up that water. Uh, the 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 challenge is, of course, that the sun is not available. Uh, more than about four or five hours a day as as far as being intense uh, and so so that you have a lot of capital tied up in uh, your equipment and if it's only running four or five hours a day then uh, it's not very cost effective and you could store the solar energy for sure uh, uh, but then that just adds complexity so in the Middle East where energy is abundant um, they they just burn fuel uh, natural gas typically and uh, heat the water uh, that way. Uh, so th there is a lot of interest in the Middle East and in, in sustainable desalination, but so far, most of its paper studies, the vast, vast majority of the water is desalinated uh, using by burning fossil fuels. That's just, just how the world is. Um, in this uh, multi-stage uh, flash cascade, what, sorry, as the, um, as the water again gets more concentrated with salt, uh, is it getting more or less compressible? And is seawater compressible compared to, you know, plain water, fresh water? Well, uh, liquid water, uh, whether salty or not, is is not very compressible. Liquids in general are not very com compressible. Uh, it's it's the vapor that's coming off of it is compressible. And, and actually, that's a good lead into the technology that we're using is called vapor compression. So if we go back to this idea of having a pot of salt water uh, that's boiling, the steam that comes off uh, is uh, in equilibrium at the temperature and pressure is matching the salt water. If you take that steam and you compress it, uh, it will condense at a higher temperature. Uh, so if we just use simple numbers, uh, let's imagine that the, uh, the, the boiling salt water is at 100 degrees uh, Celsius and the pressure is one atmosphere. Uh, if you take that steam coming off and you compress it to about 1.05 atmospheres, it'll condense at 101 degrees Celsius. So you can take that high pressure steam and condense it into liquid water. And when it, that heat of condensation transfers over into the boiling water and becomes a heat of evaporation. So, so that the energy that's causing the water to boil just circulates around and around and around and around. And what, what drives that process is a little bit of work that's invested in the compressor. So that work could be in the form of electricity as, as an example, like having electric motor uh, drive the, the compressor. Uh, so that, that method is called uh, vapor compression. Uh, at the moment, almost nowhere in the world is that used. Uh, it's, it's been known for a long time, it actually was used in World War II on submarines and PT boats as a way of uh, desalinating seawater, uh, but it, it has not, uh, it's not used to any appreciable degree uh, uh, to produce water th throughout the world. And, and quick, then, quick uh, question. Um, sure. What about um, using molten salt, you know, like these new, new, uh, new generation nuclear reactors? It seems like, I mean, they produce such prodigious heat it might be something good to marry with a desalination plant because it's just, I mean, crazy amounts of energy, even if you have well, spent. It, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, I've been approached by a company that has a, a, a new generation of molten salt nuclear reactors, and that is exactly the application that they have in mind. Uh, they have some potential funding sources from the Middle East, and uh, you know, there's a great deal of interest in, in water desalination in the Middle East. Uh, so that that is the the prime application that they're considering. So so you hit the nail on the head with that. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Um, and I guess there's also reverse osmosis, which is yet another way. Right? Boy, you could read my mind. That was the next word that was going to come out of my mouth. So the I picked it up by osmosis. I'm just <laughs> So the, the most common method in modern desalination is uh, a reverse osmosis. And it, it's, a, it's a really quite an amazing technology. Uh, you have a membrane, uh, and it, it's literally, and I'm not exaggerating, it's 500 times thinner than a human hair. So you have this really, really thin membrane. It, it's supported so on a coarse tough membrane but the the magic is done in this very very thin membrane and on one side of the membrane you have your salt water and you pressurize it to about 800 psi uh, and the uh, the fresh water pushes through the pores of the membrane but but most of the salt does not so you have a a low salt water uh, coming through then you drink that that low salt water it depending on the specifics the salinity of that uh, water that comes through is around 500 parts per million uh, which is allowed you're allowed to drink uh, up to a thousand so so it's uh, it is drinkable uh, but it, it has a you know, little bit of salt uh, in it uh, so the, uh, the the theoretical amount of energy it takes to separate a water molecule from a salt molecule uh, with our ro uh, it's about they use about twice the theoretical uh, so that's that's really good, by the way. Uh, you, you can't do the theoretical. Everything would have to be perfect. Uh, so the technology is, is uh, roughly uh, twice the theoretical. Uh, and, and so because it's much more efficient than uh, those earlier methods that I mentioned, the multi-effect distillation and the, and the multi-stage flash, uh, it has come to dominate our desalination processes. So I think the latest numbers I've seen is something like sixty uh, percent of all the new capacity is in the form of uh, uh, reverse osmosis, and the remaining forty percent is in the thermal methods, uh, primarily multi-stage flash, but also multi-effect uh, distillation as well. So now that I, I mentioned this uh, vapor compression technology, which was used in submarines in World War II, it's it's been kind of the the stepchild that that you know, nobody pays attention to. I've started paying attention to it uh, for about the last 25 years. I've been studying this vapor compression technology and and believe uh, that it's actually superior to all of the standard technology. Uh, as a result, I've devoted a substantial part of my career uh, towards uh, making that a, a practical reality. I mentioned the energy efficiency of reverse osmosis being stellar, uh, well, it so happens that vapor compression has the same efficiency as, as reverse osmosis. So it does have the potential to be a very energy efficient way of separating uh, water from salt. Yes. Quick question here. At, at, these, at the reverse osmosis plants, do they ever divert part of the pressurized water and just try to flash it? You know, if it's at 800 PSI and you really flashed it significantly, I mean, if you drop the pressure tremendously, wouldn't you get a substantial amount of water coming off? Well, the water is 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 more or less at room temperature, slightly warm because of the pumping power that goes into it. But it's for all practical purposes at, at ambient temperature. So when you drop the pressure, uh, nothing really happens. There's no 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 appreciable amount of water flashes off. Uh, what they do, and this was a a, a recent innovation that has made a huge difference in the energy efficiency. And it allows them to get to so close to the theoretical. The uh, 800 psi water uh, that's still salty, they put it through a, a turbine and and capture uh, that pressure. So so they they use that energy that was invested to pressurize the water and they recapture it and reinvest it back in the pump. Uh, so that's made a, a huge difference uh, in the uh, energy efficiency of, the, of that technology. How does the uh, membrane survive the pressure drop? I mean, even if it's on a scaffolding of a tougher membrane or tougher backing, <laughs> wouldn't it peel away or get ripped off? Well, there's there's not a lot of shear. Uh, typically, uh, these membranes are are spiral wound. Uh, there's a plastic spacer between them, uh, so it's it's typically a cylinder. Uh, they vary, but maybe five or six inches in diameter and 
maybe five feet long, something like that. And inside that tube is just a spiral with this membrane. And so the, the, the velocity of the water through the membrane is fairly low. Uh, so this, it's not subjected to a lot of shear, uh, but it does have to take the 800 PSI across the membrane. On, on one side of the membrane, it's 800 PSI. The other side of the membrane is atmospheric pressure. Uh, so, so the mechanical forces uh, have to be resisted by the scaffolding. Uh, now, the, the membranes typically last about five years, and then they have to be replaced. And so the membranes, because they're very fragile, they're also prone to fouling. So the, uh, the routine pro uh, maintenance of an RO plant is roughly every five years, you take out the membranes and put new ones in which is a, a big expense. And of course it creates a, a waste product. All those old membranes have to be disposed of in some way. Uh, so yeah, just so that, a couple more uh, questions about these. I mean, I mean, sorry, this method um, is the water being forced concentrically inwards or outwards. And is there a, a difference in performance if you do either? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. Uh, all I know is that it's in a spiral. And so it's, it's like a sandwich. Uh, every other, section is at high pressure and all the other ones are at low pressure. So uh, I, but I don't know whether the direction of the flow is towards the inside or out. I, I, I haven't studied it to that degree. I, I can't answer. Are they, are they multi-stage or are they single stage where you go through one membrane or I would guess you probably go through multiple, right? Well, uh, the, the most, the most processes are just a single stage. Uh, so you, you take the seawater as it is and uh, push it through the membrane, but there are some advanced technologies where they, I put very complex membrane systems together. And here's an example. Tightness of the membrane determines the water purity. So the tighter the membrane, the more pure the water. But on the other hand, because it's so tight, the, the flow rate is very low. So you could imagine processes where you have some loose membranes that have high volumetric flow and kind of get rid of most of the salt. And then you go to another stage where you take that mostly salt-free water and pressurize it again and get the rest of the salt out. So there's a lot, you know, you can play with these ideas in many, many different ways, and people do. But in the simple, the most common uh, way it's used is you just have, take your seawater, push it through the membrane. The seawater comes in at about three and a half percent salt, which is 35,000 parts per million, it comes out at 7% salt, which is 70,000 parts per million. And then they just throw that water back into the ocean. And the rub, that's water is roughly twice as salty as the ocean. And uh, the critters that live in the sea aren't used to twice as salty. So, so you have to be really careful about how you put that water back in. You just don't dump it in. Uh, they often have these very sophisticated distribution networks that kind of slowly meter uh, the water in to, to the ocean. But it, it, it's more dense than the regular seawater, kind of lies on the bottom and kind of a giant plume of, of the salty water. The other, but why not? Why not couple, um, you know, in a reverse osmosis plan to take the effluent and then boil it off for drinking water, let's say, and take the salt and use that for, you know, possibly for, you know, sea salt use. Why dump it back in? That just seems to be foolish. Well, uh, you're actually hitting on uh, one of the innovations that we're working on is to say it is a waste to just dump that water back into the ocean. Uh, why not uh, use that salt as a resource? And, and it, it's very interesting, the salts that are in the water, if you take, let's say, a, a cubic meter of seawater, uh, you'll say, well, I can get, you know, maybe 0.9 cubic meters of, of uh, distilled water out of that, and then the rest is uh, salt. The salt is actually worth about eight times more than the water. Uh, so, so what we should be doing is uh, looking at the uh, the salt that comes out of uh, these des desalination processes as a resource rather than a waste. Uh, and in fact, people, environmentalists are becoming increasingly upset or concerned about dumping the salt water back into the ocean. And not only is, are you putting the salt water back in, but the cleaning chemicals that were needed to keep the membranes uh, working properly, some portion of those cleaning chem chemicals ends up in the water too. Uh, which would be considered a pollutant. So there's growing movements throughout the world to stop dumping the brine, the waste salt water back into the ocean. Now, the, the issue is that normal membrane systems can only go to about 7% salt because the, the, the membranes are 
are not that strong. Theory, if you went to really high pressures, you could squeeze out more water. Mechanically, they can't take it. And, and the, it's just, it's people have optimized this system. So you, you only get about 7% salt out, out of the, the, the effluent. Uh, if you wanted to precipitate salt from the water, you have to get the concentration up to around 25 or 26%. Uh, so, so reverse osmosis is far away uh, from where it needs to be to precipitate the salts. And that gets back to uh, what I was mentioning before, this vapor compression technology. It's as efficient as reverse osmosis, but you can operate it in a way that you actually precipitate the salts and, and can uh, recover them. So, so this is called zero liquid discharge. Uh, you can literally uh, have a desalination plant on the coast. Uh, water comes in from the ocean. Almost all of it is converted into drinking water, distilled water. And then the salt uh, is, is a separate stream. And then you process that salt to get value out of it. And, and so that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm working towards. That's the vision of the future uh, that I see. Uh, and so, and so we're we're working as hard as we can to make that vision become a reality. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like it might be a, a good idea for the technology you're working on to be partnered with these reverse osmosis plants. I don't know if seven percent feedstock would be would mess you up, or if you need just regular, you know, three and a half percent salt. But then you could close the loop for them, and there'd be no effluent, just about. Well, you have very very good insights. So that is actually. Uh, one of the ways we've uh, thought about introducing our technology to the market, I mean, there's already huge, huge installed capacity of uh, RO plants around the world. And if, if let's say there's legislation that's passed that says thou shalt not dump the brine back into the ocean, uh, we can say, oh, we're, we've got a solution for you. We'll uh, t tack our plant onto your effluent and complete the job. We'll, we'll as much water as you created in the RO plant will create the same amount of water and the salt that comes out of that uh, will we'll, uh, process it and, and make valuable uh, components out of it. So most of the seawater is sodium chloride, uh, which is valuable. It's, it's used for road de-icing salt. It's obviously used in, in cooking and food preservation. Uh, it's used in industry. Uh, for example, uh, chlorine gas and sodium hydroxide are made by electrolyzing uh, sodium chloride. Uh, so there, there are uh, commercial uses. It's a high tonnage raw material. People mine salt. So we would propose that no need to, to mine salt anymore. Just take the uh, sodium chloride from the desalination plants and use that. Uh, then the second major component is magnesium chloride. Magnesium is a fascinating metal. It's lighter than aluminum. We normally think of aluminum as being the lightest metal, but actually magnesium is even lighter. And, and I've held some in my hand. Uh, it was amazingly light. I mean, it was almost almost like a sponge. It was just remarkable how lightweight it is. And it is used like in some engines have magnesium alloys. Usually it's alloyed with aluminum. Uh, so, so we could uh, have abundant uh, sources of magnesium uh, for making uh, lightweight alloys. You can also process the magnesium uh, to make a concrete out of it. Uh, that's another technology I'm working on. Uh, so we can, uh, and cars concrete has huge, huge volumes. Uh, so we think that would be a, a very large outlet for the, all that magnesium. Would then, it be like a magnesium, magnesium doped concrete that's what lighter or has other material properties you're interested in? It, it is lighter. Uh, it's stronger. It's a remarkable material, actually. I've been work making uh, concrete materials, concrete like materials out of magnesium now for about a year and a half, and I've become very, very impressed uh, with uh, magnesium as a as a building material. And so, I, I, and also, if you do it right, it can have a super insulation qualities. So, as we're thinking about addressing global warming, uh, the building material itself can capture CO2. When we take the magnesium chloride, we actually turn it into magnesium carbonate. So, we 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 capture CO2. Uh, half the weight, in fact, more than half the weight of the building material is CO2. Uh, so for you know every ton of uh, magnesium, there's a, a ton of CO2 uh, that's there. Uh, and then uh, the third component that's major in, in salt is potassium chloride. 
uh, which is uh, very, very valuable as a fertilizer. Uh, so, so we can take the major salts, uh, the three major salts in seawater and find a home for them. And then there's almost every element in the periodic table is also in the sea. Uh, and there's, there's valuable minerals uh, such as gold and silver, uranium, uh, and so forth that are present in the, uh, uh, and lithium in the, uh, in the, in the minor salts. And so we, I think you have a, you have a winning combination here because you could say to an RO plant, you don't need to dump it anymore. We'll take the feedstock with you. We'll give you X amount back of purified water. So it looks like your plant has even more capacity. We'll take all the salt and do our stuff with it. I mean, it's, it just seems like a win, win, win. You can monetize the, the other parts of the seawater and the salt. I mean, tremendously in a whole bunch of ways. Uh, and it I, would stop fishing populations from being destroyed. And I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I think you, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I, I really believe uh, that we can do what you say. We, we don't know yet the economics of separating the salt into various components. My intuition is that it, it can be done economically. I think we can, but that's yet to be proven. But if, if it is economical to separate the salts into the various components, uh, that's an additional income stream, and it, it essentially makes the water cheaper. In other words, you have this all this capital investment there to separate water and salt. Currently, we only value the water and we throw away the salt. If we if we make the salt valuable also, then uh, that income stream helps pay for the plant and it should make the water cheaper. It's a win-win for everybody. It, it's uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. Why why wouldn't we do this other than it's still it doesn't exist commercially yet, and that that's <laughs> that's what I'm working on is to make it into a commercial product. Yeah, and I guess I don't know if it would be beneficial to selectively flocculate or precipitate out certain types of uh, or certain elements out of the salt and then process it or wait till it's all dry and then do it that way. But I guess you could figure that out as part of it. There, there are uh, a number of approaches and what you described. Uh, there are people that are processing the salt in that way. They add chemicals that c- cause elements to precipitate or flocculate, as you described. Uh, so there are, are a number of approaches. Uh, that that's not the approach that we take. Uh, anytime you add a chemical to do something, it's an extra cost. And so I, I strive to, to develop processes that you don't have to add extraneous chemicals to to the largest degree possible. You can't always do it, but uh, that that's that, that's kind of the ideal is 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 to not be dependent on other chemicals to to make your process work. Would it would it do anything to um, have the effluent from the RO? plant go through like a a large sediment tank and if the water was deep enough would there be enough of the head where let's say you had a membrane at the bottom with just you know the weight of the water be enough to uh to create enough pressure to to do anything with the effluent to take any of the salt out well it's use gravity you have a very creative mind so let's imagine it takes 10 meters to make an atmosphere or 14 15 psi Uh, so your tank would have to be really really uh deep oh uh, and, and it is true at the bottom of this tank, it'll be a uh, high pressure, but then the water coming out of that tank is presumably has a, uh, you have to have a pump that pumps the water out of that. And it has a large head. It, it has to, I, I haven't done the math in my head, but let's just imagine it's a uh, 300 feet or something like that is the, how deep your tank has to be. Well, the, to get the water out of your tank, you have to pump the clean water 300 feet out of this big tank that you just created so you're going to pay you have a pump somewhere either you're going to have a pump inlet to the salt water or a pump taking the fresh water out you you just can't get away from it i see okay well very good mark it's really interesting the technology you develop you're developing and i really hope that you're able to score some uh a pilot plant in the near future to be able to do it Uh, you have to have to contact me uh we don't really have a a website or anything like that uh, set up so if anybody's interested uh, I'm happy to uh, communicate by email or phone call, whichever makes the most sense. Uh, but we we are actively moving to uh, commercialize this technology. There's a whole bunch of patents that are in the process of going through the system right now. Uh, we've have we're we're having discussions with money people to see if we can get the resources to take these ideas and turn them into reality. Uh, so, so far, we nobody showered us with money yet, but we're, we always remain hopeful. Okay. Well, again, Mark, it's a great thing you're, you're working on, and uh, I appreciate you coming back on the podcast. It's, it's always great to talk to you.
It's my pleasure. Uh, you do a great job, and I, I really feel honored uh, to be interviewed by you. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.